Hi, I'm Eric. Again, not in the studio for this week's In Focus. We actually still are on the campus of Indiana University East, our home, but we're going to be talking about Purdue Polytechnic Richmond. So we're going to talk to uh, their director, Michael Swain, talk to some of their students, and find out what's going on here at one of Richmond's best kept secrets. Welcome to this week's In Focus. And we start this episode of In Focus by being joined by the big guy. <laughs> In more ways than one. <laughs> Michael Swain, who is director of Purdue Polytechnic Richmond. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Oh, you're so welcome. Thanks for having me. Okay, I have to ask a question. What's Polytechnic? <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Big university like Ohio State, Indiana University, Purdue University, usually divided up into academic units called colleges. So Purdue's pretty well known for its College of Engineering, College of Agriculture, College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, and there was, up until recently, a College of Technology, which was kind of applied engineering, applied computer sciences. And we've revisioned it and uh, transformed it into a polytechnic, which means a blending of different types of technologies. So our classrooms now will integrate many different types of technology, so you won't exclusively be doing mechanical. You could be doing things that might have to do with computers as well, electricity, uh, vice versa. If you're doing a computer degree, there's going to be some engineering type stuff you're going to be doing. Uh, it's very much learning by doing very much project-oriented, project-focused. Um, it's going to be a very hands-on type of degree with lots of uh, practical experiences built into it. So every student will have an internship and a senior project to do and opportunities to work alongside people in the community as well, businesses in the community. So it reflects, the Polytechnic kind of reflects all of that. But at its heart, it's still produced College of Technology. Okay, and that explains some of what I'm seeing around me, which I have no <laughs> idea what the thing in the case is. Okay, all right. Well, what we're sitting in right now is a, uh, a lab that's for the uh, engineering technologies, and this one has to do with material sciences. So in robotics, in mechanical engineering technology, in you know, any kind of engineering technology, you're dealing with materials, whether it be plastics or uh, metals or some sort of composite materials, um, which are made up of a variety of different types of materials. And students in here do experiments and test with those. The big glass case that's on our, beside us here uh, tests the strength and hardness of materials because there are certain aspects that you don't want to something to fail, or if it's going to fail, you want to know at what point, say like, you know, the shell of your aircraft. You don't want uh, your wing falling off for lack of not understanding what kind of tolerances and, and strains it can hold up under. So our students are testing various materials to see how much it can take before it fails. Uh, we have a plastics center in here. We have a 3D printer that's in this room as well. Uh, we have some high-powered microscopes so we can see just minute microscopic uh, flaws in different types of metals, which don't account for much if you look at it, but once you get, once you start building something with it, that microscopic flaw could be something that could determine whether or not that, that machine or that part's going to work. And when I say machines, uh, with mechanical engineering technology, a machine can be anything from a, from a mechanical pencil. How do you advance the lead on a mechanical pencil? That's a mechanism, that's a machine, all the way up to a roller coaster or a space shuttle. Those are machines as well, everything in between. So uh, it's anything that has moving parts and, and uh, mechanisms in it that, that qualify it as a machine are students in mechanical study. Um, 
And then in robotics, uh, which we also have here as well, we have a robotics engineering technology. Um, students are learning how to program and troubleshoot and uh, integrate robots to do some functions. Um, for instance, my mother uh, worked at General Electric for a number of years and she did what they call piecework, where it was just taking pieces of material and moving it from one place to another. A, just a repetitious movement all day long. Mm -hmm. And now they have machines that do that type of thing. Um, sorting they can do. Uh, different, different mechanical processes that uh, make places more efficient and uh, bring up the quality of what they do uh, can all involve robotics. Uh, another application for robotics that, that you can see sometimes are uh, in first responders or defense. You know, you can have robots that go up and disarm bombs where you don't have people then um, risking themselves to do that. Uh, rescue missions and other things like those. Uh, even in the hospital, uh, in Reed Hospital, they have robots that are there. Um, they have robotic sweepers that are cleaning the floors. Uh, they have robotic mechanisms that now change the sheets on some of the beds. They have uh, the uh, I think the pharmacy is now mechanized as well there. So there's all kinds of applications for that type of thing. Sounds like you all are putting a lot of people out of work. Uh, no, actually, we're not putting the people out of work. What we're doing is, is getting people work in the new, new world in which we live. Uh, that, you know, that world is, has come and is here. And it's not like it was when, when my parents were working. Uh, it's, it's a very technical, very uh, different world, digital world that we live in. And what we're doing is, is trying to get people ready for those types of careers. So. How do you have that conversation with the high school students of today? Do they understand it? And do their parents understand it? It's, it's the parents sometimes that uh, maybe are thinking in terms of how things used to be. Um, I think the students have come to a, uh, accept a more digital, mechanized type of world that we live in. Um, the parents sometimes recall how it used to be uh, with, with a lot of uh, manual jobs that, that aren't there anymore. Just like you said, it sounds like you're putting a lot of people out of work. Well, Those jobs are already gone. Right, exactly. Which is, which is why there's so many people having a difficult time exactly. with the economy of today. Exactly. And so, and so, you know, having that conversation, if we can just get people to understand that, um, then we can, we can help them find where their place is going to be in this, in this new economy that we're talking about. Um, one thing that is, that we do have to work against sometimes is uh, when we talk about mechanical engineering technology or robotics or something like that, people naturally assume, oh, it's going to be in a factory someplace. And a lot of times they think, oh, factories are dirty, noisy places. Uh, a lot of factories are more like laboratories now. Very quiet, very mechanized, uh, very clean. You gotta work in a clean environment on those things. And so it's not, it's not the old, you know, Ford assembly lines like you used to see when uh, Henry Ford was <laughs> and invented them. Sure. So it's, it's a very different environment that people work in in that now. And a lot of that stuff is not factories. It's all, all over the place. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether you're working in a distribution center or whether you're working in a hospital or an amusement park or things like that, there's, there are all kinds of ways that uh, that engineering uh, plays a part in what gets done at those places as well. So it's not, you're not just pigeonholed into one type of career. And getting people to understand that, I think, uh, is, is pretty important because a lot of people feel like, well, I, I don't want to, my kid to go into a factory, or I don't want to go into a factory, but it's not, like I said, it's not your grandfather's factory anymore. It's, it's a very different environment. When you, people talk about whitewater community television sometimes, they talk about a, a well-kept secret in the community that everybody doesn't know and understand. Yeah. I hear the same thing sometimes about Purdue Polytechnic. Mm -hmm. you, you've been here quite a while. Yeah, 50 years. 50 years, <laughs> but people really don't necessarily know all that you do and what's available here. Right. How are you continuing to work to overcome that? Well, uh, 
we're always working to overcome that. Um, one of the things that, about us is we're funded differently than, than Purdue University is. And so when people think of Purdue University, they think about it some big global corporation almost with a multi-billion dollar um, type of budget to work with. Mm -hmm. But locations like ours are funded through a different way. They're funded through uh, a, a different appropriation through the state legislature. And so we're also funded by you know what we bring in in tuition. And, and by that respect, we don't have huge advertising budgets. So we don't have billboards, a lot of billboards around town. We don't have, you know, commercials and, and, and things that we can do because, ooh, honestly, we can't, we don't have the budget to do that right now. But what we try to do is go out, let people know we're here, and then bring them out to show them what we do because we feel like that's what really speaks for us is to get people in here to see it, see that it's actually real, that you can really do Purdue University curriculum and get a Purdue University degree here, and that you can uh, save a bunch of money doing it. It's, it's a fraction of the cost to go to the main campus of Purdue and uh, get them involved and get their hands on some stuff and see whether or not it's for them. So we've set up some days out here where uh, we have a computer graphics day coming up where students from high schools could come out and get on a computer and do some stuff in computer graphics. We have an engineering technology day where students can come out and uh, do some engineering projects and then program a robot and then take it through an obstacle course and do some things like that. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to get, get our name out there. We're not as big as everyone else either. Um, Earlham, Ivy Tech, IU East, they're all considerably larger than we are because they offer a wider range of degrees than we do. We're much more specialized than uh, any of those places. Uh, we offer eight Purdue University degrees here, and they're either in the fields of computer graphics or engineering technology. Mm -hmm. So we don't have nursing and philosophy and ceramics and, you know, accounting here. So um, so for that reason, we, we've remained small, uh, but we feel like what we do here is meaningful. Uh, we feel that the students come out with, with a meaningful education that can contribute to the economy, to the society. Uh, you can do a lot of good with the stuff we're doing. You can do a lot of good as an engineer and you can come up with new and improved ways. You can come up and, and use them towards biomedical type of things. So there's a lot of good you can do with the stuff that we do here as well. And you'll get paid pretty well for doing it. Um, and as the older generation of engineers start to cycle out of the out of the uh, places that make things, mm -hmm. they're going to need new ones. And this generation's poised to be the ones who can slide in there. So um, we're hoping to get that message out as well. Innovation is obviously a key to what happens here because you're constantly having to retool, constantly having to, to innovate yourselves a little bit, remake yourselves a little bit mm -hmm. for whatever is coming down the pipe. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? How do you keep that thought process fresh, not only in your mind, mm -hmm. in your faculty's mind, uh -huh. in the community's mind? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, uh, one of the things is, regarding the faculty are that they are all members of Purdue University's uh, faculty at West Lafayette. So in the mechanical engineering uh, degree program, our professors are part of that faculty, so they're in on the faculty meetings. They, they help form the, uh, the curriculum for those types of degrees. Same with computer graphics. Our people are uh, hired and uh, report to the computer graphics department at West Lafayette. So they are, so that keeps them on the cutting edge of things because that, that those departments have to be. Um, and then in addition to that, uh, just having to be a polytechnic and trying to think of new ways to do things. Our um, 
you know, essential. And so they they always try to think of the next the next way to uh, be able to teach something. What new technologies are coming out? What skills are going to be needed? There's a lot of value added to our degrees too. I think one of the things that we teach is is um, not only how to be a technologist or a scientist or an engineer or a graphic designer, but also how to be a professional. Um, we build a lot of that in there too. Uh, and we integrate uh, humanities into some of our classes as well. Uh, and you may have talked with uh, Michelle Walker earlier uh, in another segment um, where they're integrating a lot of history uh, into a project that the computer graphics students are working on. They've learned as much about Richmond history uh, working on that project as anything else. Um, and, and so those are things that, that we, uh, we are trying to do. Uh, we're trying to partner with IU East and Ivy Tech as much as we possibly can. And so that always requires innovation, cooperation, coordination. So um, that's, that's one of the ways we do it. How do you expand? Where do you go? You're, you're in a building on the IU East campus. Mm -hmm. You're sharing part of this building. You're talking about maybe doing and, and moving into some of the Ivy Tech space. Mm -hmm. How do those collaborations work? And how does that affect what your students are able to learn and what you're able to bring to the community? Yeah. Um, well, what, one of the, you mentioned that we are moving some of the uh, programs. We are in the midst of moving our engineering technology programs more over into McDaniel Hall of Ivy Tech because programmatically uh, our engineering technologies and what they do in that building link up uh, a little bit better. Uh, that way they can have access to our uh, machinery and our devices and we can have access to theirs. It helps out the community by not asking for duplicate resources uh, if we can share. Uh, it helps having those students together um, because that way they get to know each other. Who knows, maybe some great ideas for some inventions or some companies can come out of that. Uh, the Ivy Tech students, once they get their two-year degree, might then decide to go on to the uh, Purdue bachelor's degree. And then over here on the IU East side, where we've been for, for a long time, uh, what, what we do is work with their uh, fine arts department in our computer graphics. Uh, they take some of our computer graphics courses. They take two or three of them, I think. Um, and we uh, coordinate with them and work with them a lot. Um, and our students take a lot of their general education courses from IU professors. And it gives them a really broad range of, of electives that they can choose from. And it's, it's really nice to have that accessibility because you know, they could be taking a history course from a, a full tenured professor rather than uh, maybe up at West Lafayette where they have to take something from a graduate student or a teaching assistant or something. And so it, it works out really well. Um, and I think we our degree programs all complement each other. I don't think we really um, are in any kind of competition. I think it all it all really melds together very well. What's the relationship with the business community? Considering what you all are doing, what's the relationship mm -hmm. with the business community? How has that continued to grow and evolve through the years? Okay. Um, well, some of the community has changed a little bit. Uh, we used to have a really strong relationship with Visteon when they were still in Connorsville, but that's ancient history now. Uh, but we still do have at uh, some local uh, tool and die places or places where they make engineering and machinery, uh, custom build it. Uh, so we, at A House uh, Engineering, at Nixon, uh, at Mosey, we have strong relationships with them. Uh, over at, uh, oh. Osborne, I'm so sorry, I, I, I blank for just one second. Uh, over at Osborne, where they make industrial brushes, uh, pretty much their engineering department is made up of people who've gone to school here at, at Richmond. And, and they're doing very well. They're doing very successfully. Um, 
we have some products and in, in some maybe new degree programs that we're hoping to put out that can really be something that the plastics industries here around town can kind of customize a degree for themselves. We have a lot of food production in this area, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be pet food or people food, uh, and we're hoping that we can maybe get with them and customize some sort of degree program that might help benefit uh, those industries. So uh, stay tuned for those. Talk about the, the, and you started by saying students do different work, including an internship, something mm -hmm. that, that is real important. Talk about why you all feel that that's so important and, and make such a big push toward it. Okay. Um, well, our students have always blended the theoretical and the practical. Uh, that's one of the strengths of the programs that, that we've always done here and that the College of Technology, now the Polytechnic, has done. And what better way to do that uh, at, uh, as you get deeper into your program than to go out and, and test it in a real business setting. Uh, it gives students a chance to experience what it's like to work for a real company and not be in a classroom. Uh, it gives um, the businesses not only a chance to have you know, educated people working on projects for them, but you know they also get a first look and see if maybe they want to have an employee out of that. Um, and so it's a, I think it's a win-win for everyone on that one. Is there a growth model for what happens here? Or is this just kind of a, we're just going to maintain where we are, our classes are going to be? Because uh -huh. your, class, your class size really, I think, is relatively small. Yeah, they are. A they um, lot of hands-on, a mm -hmm. um, lot of great interaction yeah. with, with the professors. Is, is the idea to keep it about like that, or are you looking for... How do we grow our student population? How do we grow ourselves? How do we create our own building, maybe? Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. We, we feel as if what, we, what we're doing right now is, is great, but we feel like we could do more. We feel as if we could, we could easily handle double the amount of students we have right now. Um, we would like to grow enrollment. Um, and part of it goes back to what you were talking about before, just not enough people understanding that we're here and what we do, and hopefully this program will help on that. Um, no pressure. But, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> but the growth, the growth model is, you know, just uh, keep, keep working with the community. Uh, have the communities see us more as, a, as a, more and more as a resource to the community uh, that they can turn to, and hopefully, as that happens, more and more people will learn about us, find out about us, and uh, you know, more more students will come here. Um, yeah. <laughs> How? What? Haven't I asked you about that? You feel the community really needs to know about Purdue Polytech. Mm. I mean, obviously, I can come up with some questions. Sure. We talked about some things ahead of time. But is there something in your mind that you think the community doesn't know about you all that they need to? Well, I guess just to reiterate that, that we've been around for 50 years. Uh, we're, not, we're not some new entity in town. We've been around for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, what we do, we do exceptionally well. It is Purdue University quality uh, in everything that we do. It's a Purdue University curriculum with Purdue University faculty. Students come away with courses on a Purdue University transcript and ultimately a Purdue University degree. Um, it's, it's just more specialized. Uh, and, but the things that we specialize in are things that make a difference. Um, it's creative. I mean, even, even when you think about engineering, it's very creative to think of a new way to do something or think of an invention or think of a machine or something that's never been done before. Uh, we have this need, how can, we, how can we meet this need? Let's invent something that can fulfill that. On the graphic side, it's very creative and um, there's lots of things that you can do with computer graphics besides just do uh, special effects in movies or cartoons or video games. Uh, all that technology is being used all over the place. And so it's a, it's a degree program that can be applied towards a whole lot of different things. 
um, educationally and in simulations for medical and in industrial type purposes. Uh, so what we do here has an impact, um, has an impact on the students' lives. Uh, they come away as problem solvers. They come away as thinkers. They come away as confident individuals who can go out and, and perform a variety of, of different things because they've learned how to think essentially like an engineer. Um, and it's, it's an asset to the community uh, because, because the students who come out with those skills usually stay around this area. And uh, it's an economical alternative uh, to going to uh, the main campus of Purdue University. And uh, it's, it's just a fantastic resource to have around here. And just, uh, I would love for people to spread the word and let more and more of their friends know uh, that, we're, that we're here. Commencement's coming up. Do you know how big the uh, graduating class is this You year? know, I should, but I don't. It's usually around 30, uh, give or take. So again, we're specialized. We're, so, you know, we don't have You're not doing 600. You're doing 30. But right. you're doing 30 that yeah. are making a difference. Absolutely we are. Appreciate that. Yeah. I appreciate you taking some time. Well, thank you. Thank you. Michael Swain, director of Purdue Polytechnic Richmond. Hi, I'm Eric Marsh, host of Eastern Indiana Works, a new program providing information about jobs and workforce development tools in East Central Indiana. Join me on the premiere episode as we talk with Rushville Mayor Mike Pavey, Kirk Robbins from Magna Machine and Tool, and Winnie Logan, director of the Newcastle Henry County Public Library. Eastern Indiana Works, Tuesday evenings at 1030 on WETV, Channel 20. Family disaster plan is the document that a family would make to prepare themselves on how they would respond or how they would react to any event or emergency. The plan should be written by all members of the family. That way they have ownership. They all have involvement. Everyone's ideas are addressed and concerned and all brought together to make a complete document. Contact information is important because you and your loved ones may be separated during an event. If you're separated, you have to know who to be in contact with so you all can communicate eventually together. Family members may be at different locations. They should have a central meeting point away from the home where they all know they can go to reunite and become a whole family again. Everyone should be prepared. When families are more prepared, it makes the community more prepared, and that's better for everyone involved. Hi, I'm Sherry Harlan Davis, program host for Read Beside You. Join us on our next episode of Read Beside You, where we will discuss autism with Kaylee Loisel Shelby Murder and Jeremy Voorhees. It said if you met one person with autism, you've just met one person with autism. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. yes, that is so important to remember. Mm -hmm. Join us Thursday, Channel 20, WETV at 8 o'clock. My name is um, Rex Connell, and I'm an associate professor uh, in the MET program. MET stands for Mechanical Engineering Technology. Um, essentially, we teach students how to um, manufacture or make things out of materials. And so we teach them starting from concepts to design to selection of material and to how you process that material to get a desired product. And that's what we do here. Uh, so uh, to my right, you have several labs. Uh, we have a materials lab where we teach students how to determine the property of materials. If they can locate it in a, a table or a journal, uh, we can go there and do testing of material so we can find out if it's strong 
or if it can share when we waste it um, and what kind of load it can take before it does shear. Uh, and so that way we can uh, discard the weak material and select the best material for the specific application. Um, and then we also deal with energy, um, thermodynamics. The students in the class there are taking thermodynamics tests. Anything we do involves thermodynamics. So if you're cooking, making cookies in the oven, you need heat in order to facilitate the chemical process, you know, like baking. The same thing we do with um, processing of metals. Um, if we want to produce a desired shape of steel, we have processes like casting. To do casting, we have to out supply heat to the material to melt it and pour it in molten form. And so we need to find out how heat affects metal. And a specific application, it's for those of us that are old enough uh, to remember 9-11, uh, once the plane hit the Twin Tower, the metal, the heat metal, the metal, the heat metal, the metal structure, and then the uh, tower start, started falling. And so the same thing happens with our heat processing uh, thermodynamics. We try to show students how heat can affect metal. Um, a specific application is in welding. So we use this touch, high temperature flame, to put two materials together. Well, the heat can either make the metal, the joint stronger, or it can weaken them. And so there's this transformation that goes on and we need to tell our students, or teach our students that um, what you see may not be what you get. So you need to know how materials or metals be, you know, react to heat, thermal energy. So we teach them thermodynamics. <laughs> so, um, so we teach them um, um, design. Um, it used to be the case when I, st when I was, work when I was uh, a student, that was many moons ago. <laughs> uh, we used to do 2Ds, uh, 2D drawing by hand, but now everything is digital. And so we start with 3D, not 2D. So this is, we see, we see in 3D, three dimensions. And, um, and so we start with 3D and students can then go to 2D from there. And technology has improved things so much that we can do things much faster and more efficiently. And so we start from 3D design, uh, the material, and we have the capability of doing rapid prototyping. So we design the material, we actually make a model of the material. So if a client wants to produce that, they can feel it, touch it, and see if the design is appropriate before you go to mass production. So if it's not appropriate, you don't generate scrap. So we have rapid prototyping and the students learn how to do rapid prototyping. And if the design is appropriate, then we go to doing material selection and doing all the processing that needs to go along with it to get your final products. Um, in between, we do things like quality control. Um, um, right now, when I was working in the industry, it's after you produce something, you check the quality. If it's not, uh, if it doesn't meet quality, you go and reprocess it. But right now, the technology has advanced so much that we have real-time quality control, Six Sigma, um, that has moved the level. So we can, as we're producing something, we're doing real-time quality control. If something happens, uh, we have bar charts that are being generated as we go along. It tells us that something is out of work here. We stop immediately. We stop the process immediately so that we don't generate scraps. That has to be reworked and that goes into uh, reducing the efficiency of production because it increases costs. Uh, and so uh, all these things are combined not only to produce the material but to produce it efficiently and cost effective. So that's what we try to do here. <laughs>
back to In Focus on Whitewater Community Television's WGTV Channel 11. I'm Eric Marsh, the, the question guy. I think that's what I'm going to call myself. That, you know, there used to be the Shell Answer Man, and for all you older people in the room, explain that to the younger people in the room. Um, so now I'm just the question guy. <laughs> and we are actually in Tom Raper Hall on the Indiana University East Campus, but we are in a classroom that is mostly belonging to Purdue Polytechnic Richmond. So um, I, with Michelle Walker, who I have to do my disclaimer, is also a member of the Whitewater Community Television Board of Directors. <laughs> There's a lot of those people out there. <laughs> one day we'll tell you how you can be one if you'd like. Yeah. Thanks for spending some time with us. Thanks for having me, Eric. You are a continuing lecturer here. What does that mean? That means that my focus is primarily on teaching and working one-on-one -on -one with students and mentoring and guiding them through the program, helping them one-on-one -on -one with projects, and just devoting the majority of my time to just being in the classroom with students. What's the project that you've been working on here lately that we were watching? So it's a really exciting project. Last year we were challenged to innovate our program to do what they refer to as horizontal and vertical integration of the curriculum. Now that's a mouthful. Yes. What that means is we wanted horizontal integration, which was many classes working side by side across the curriculum. And then the vertical component comes in with the upperclassmen mentoring to the younger classmen. So we had this cohesiveness of a program where we were no longer simply working in silos. Instead of having discrete classes that had nothing to do with one another, I developed a pipeline system. It's more reflective of what happens in industry. So what we had, for instance, in the fall, we had the digital illustration class doing concept art for the special project. We had the intro to 3D modeling students doing prototype 3D models that were handed off to the advanced 3D modeling class that further developed those 3D models. All of those assets went into a student showcase. We had a lot of attendance here, a lot of excitement. Um, that All of those assets were then put into a game development environment where we had game developers taking the 3D models, the animations, the art, and creating a game that has historical significance for the Star Jeanette history in the Star Valley in Richmond, Indiana. What, are, what, what will the game do? Where will it go? Once, once that kind of thing is created by the students, does it become something that gets downloaded on Google? Is it just here on your computers? What happens? Yeah, so we are sort of building the airplane as we're flying it. <laughs> it's very exciting. But, you hear uh, that in business a lot, don't right. you? Um, as of a week ago, we actually were beta testing our game with some high school students in Greenville, Ohio, and we did a heuristic analysis. That's part of our program is we beta test, we get data, we bring that data back into the classroom, we examine what changes need to be made, just as a real game studio would. So right now they're working on making some revisions, taking those suggestions into account. We are in a race to the deadline. At the end of the semester, what we hope to have is a packaged game that we can give to the community, that the community can play, and they will be able to have a virtual walkthrough of the Star Valley as it was in the 1920s. They'll hear the music of the Star recording artists. They will be able to see the buildings that were in place that are unfortunately no longer there. Uh, they'll hear all the ambient sounds. And the game component is that they'll be able to collect the medallions that we see in the Walk of Fame, okay. uh, you'll be able to run through the environment and score points for collecting those medallions. And as you collect that medallion, you'll hear a snippet of music from that musical artist. Wow, yeah. that's a lot. My students have worked really hard on this and they've done a tremendous job. What's the kind of software integration and that, that they're using and is it what they would be using in the real world? Very much. We use industry standard software. Now to an extent, uh, we are software agnostic in the sense that if someone comes in and they have a 3D modeling background and they've been using Blender, those principles, those theories of camera movements or how to do correct topology, those things happen no matter what software you're in. We happen to use Autodesk Maya 
just because it is a standard of the industry. We have it loaded on all of our computers here. Students can download it free as a student license. So for 3D modeling, we use Autodesk Maya because that's what the major uh, studios use. Um, for 2D work and video editing, we use the Adobe Creative Suite. Again, industry standard software. So we're using Photoshop, Illustrator, InDesign, Adobe Premiere, um, all of those Adobe programs. One of the things that, that people keep asking from an, from an economic development standpoint is how do we keep young people in this area? The jobs, the, the things that you have them working on, are there jobs here either in Richmond, Wayne County or in this region where they can take this skill set and transfer it and still remain here? That's why it's great that we get to be on a program like yours and make our community aware that we have these graduates that are entering into the field. They're job ready. They've been trained on industry standard. They have been taught teamwork. They've been taught how to work together in platforms that they can communicate synchronously and asynchronously. They're learning leadership skills, collaboration, all of those things. They are job ready. They are eager to get into the workforce. We want to help em local employers understand what an asset these students can be to their business. So I go into the community, I visit um, local industries, and I show them, like, you need a student that can do this, we have a student that can do that. So there are some in-house jobs in terms of marketing, uh, visual communications, video editing, um, all of those things. We would like to expand that more locally. One of our challenges, frankly, is trying to help the community understand how some of our other skill sets like 3D modeling and animation can also be an asset. That's why a project like this is so important because we're showing that serious games can be used in education. Uh, they can be used to visually communicate uh, learning examples, historical examples, it can be used in architecture, it can be used in healthcare. So we could create a healthcare model that could be used in a training course to teach nurses something that has to be 3D modeled. We can actually take things into our virtual reality lab and studies have proven that you can create things virtually that people experience but that knowledge is transferable very quickly into the real world. So for instance, people like firefighters are using VR training because they don't have to physically enter a dangerous situation to understand that kinesthetic movement. I touch this, I go here. It's a full body immersive experience. We can do all that here with our 3D modeling, our game development, our virtual reality lab. Um, my hope is that we can take the game that we've invented bring it into virtual reality so that you can put on a VR headset and literally walk through the Star Valley and hear the music around you as you're immersed in that experience. How do you find the students that have the drive, have the interest in being a part of this program? Because it's not a large mm -hmm. program. Um, so how do, how do you talk to the students? Where do you find them? How do you reach out to them? And how do you tell them that this exists? Because you're sharing a space with someone who has a, I'll say a larger name in some mm -hmm. ways than yeah. you. This is the IU East campus is how yeah. people think of it. Right. Well, that's why we are relying on our community to help us get that word out, like through programs like this. We do social media campaigns, we do videos where we show what we are creating and try to get the community excited about it. Uh, we do a student showcase. We do a few day, what we call like a day in college event where students come in High school students get to sit in a classroom and we teach them the same skills that they would learn if they were in college. Um, we do special events. We go into the high schools and talk to the high schoolers there. We want to meet students where they are. And so I'll, walk, I'll go into a high school if I'm invited and I'll speak to a class and explain to them what we do. But we found that reaching out through programs like this, social media, allowing people to come here to our classroom and experience it, once they understand how unique and special and exciting our program is, that news travels. Is it difficult to get students to think about staying home 
as it were, to do this program as opposed to going to the West Lafayette campus, yeah. maybe? I think that our program offers a unique situation for students who want more one-on-one -on -one mentoring in a smaller class size with an affordable program where they can live close to home. No, we're not going to capture every student who wants that big campus experience and we're not trying to compete with that. But if the things that you value is staying close to your community, affordability, having the autonomy to live in your own space instead of living in a residence hall and having a smaller class size with more one-on-one -on -one mentoring, then we're the right choice for that student. As you look at where this program can grow, what do you envision in the future from what you're reading, from what you're thinking? Because we've heard you're trying to answer problems and actually put students in a position to be able to think about jobs that don't exist. Yes. How, how, do, you, how do you think about carrying this forward mm -hmm. and, and what you all need, what, what Purdue Polytechnic needs to do to continue on that trajectory? So our leadership is very supportive of innovation. Our Polytechnic Dean came to visit us last Thursday and he strongly encourages to continue to innovate from a learner-centered perspective. So every semester I'm interviewing students asking them what works for you, what would you like to see us innovate, what would you like to see us do different, and we talk to employers uh, in the community, we ask them the same questions. What do you need our graduates to be able to do for you when they graduate? So we don't teach the same class that we taught six years ago. We don't teach it the same way that we taught it a year ago. We are always innovating to meet that challenge because our students are going to have to reinvent themselves all the time as well. Does that put more pressure on you and the rest of the faculty? I guess some people might look at it that way, but I enjoy a dynamic environment where that's always challenging me to think creatively and be innovative. Michelle Walker, continuing lecturer with Purdue Polytechnic in Richmond. Thanks for spending some time. Thank you. I was happy to be here. Well, this is our game. We have a main menu where you can uh, go to the instructions. If you, Since our target audience is a group that has never really played games, uh, they don't know that WASD is your move you can move the character, W is forward, S is back, A is turn left, D is turn right. Uh, you move the camera with your mouse, but then you can go back to the main menu, then press start, and then here's the game as it stands right now. My pr part of the uh, project is level designer. I designed the landscape, I placed the buildings, I placed assets. I'm like the first and then the last. Whatever we do first, okay, we do that. And then with, when they get it done, I place it into the scene. And our biggest part of the game is these medallions. Um, when uh, each medallion has a uh, uh, music of that artist, so the Uncle Dave, Louis Armstrong, uh, the medallions are actually ones that are down in the Walk of Fame in the Richmond Star Valley Gorge right now. Um, and our object of the game is for you to explore the environment, but then to c con collect all the medallions. So when I ran into the uh, medallion, it went from a zero to a one. But as you walk away, you don't hear the music. As you get closer, you hear the music. And we're working on a custom particle system right now where once you run into it, uh, little music notes can float above. Right now, we just have a placeholder smoke particle effect. Well, I'm Trent Evans. I'm the resident blueprint engineer of sorts. Anything that mainly functions, like the medallion system, how the counter goes up, the soon-to-be-finished compass, the spinning effects, most of those things run down my track. I am the uh, 3D modeler for this project. Um, the, the textures aren't there, so it just looks like a charcoal building. But eventually, with that file there, um, you can see these are all the faces that will be uh, placed onto the building to give it the look of wood or brick or metal or tiles. 
Uh, my name is John Creech, and I've been the innovations manager for our game design team. So anytime we need to research a new topic such as exporting the game as a finished product or maybe a new effect on the game like running water or particles, uh, the team will come to me and let me know what needs to be researched and I will, in a timely manner, research it, put together a presentation so we can talk about it. So I teach freshmen in the Purdue Polytechnic and I wrap around I get to work with them as seniors. Um, in the last class I talked to the freshmen about what they wanted out of the program. I try to do that with each group at the end of the sem spring semester just to kind of make sure that they feel welcomed and to make sure we're meeting their needs. Um, we serve them like they are clients, so we try to give them what they want, and we try to wrap their experience around that. And this generation really wants shorter lectures and more hands-on experience, so that works perfect for the graphics program because we are all hands-on, not all hands-on, but mostly. Um, they want real-world experience, so that's been good for us because at the Purdue Polytechnic we try to bring in engagement projects and we have involved projects where freshmen get to work all the way up to this with the senior students. It's called horizontal vertical integration. Um, so the freshmen, sophomore, junior, seniors work in a project combined across all four majors. So we have um, gaming, video game design, animation as a major, web design as a major, and then we have general computer graphics technology. So all majors work together, all classes work together into one really large project. So the project that we just finished with the freshmen is they created some building information modeling. They built models, um, they built buildings to go into this group that's working now. Um, that'll go into their final game. So we are trying to combine the scheduling so that we can work with different groups. Um, so next year we'll do some really neat projects with horizontal vertical integration that will include um, real world architecture. We'll work with 3D modeling, building information modeling, um, doing schematic design phase for a new project. We're gonna be designing buildings and putting them into virtual uh, environments. So we'll eventually take that into virtual reality and make it an experience for someone to walk through as if they have um, a real world experience in the building. Our, our first priority is our students and what they're getting out of their education. They're paying for it. We want them to hit the ground running when they graduate. And I mean, it, it's important to us to make them happy. It's, I mean, it's important for retention. It's important for them to feel like they're a part of something bigger. So um, they each come in with a different interest and a different skill set, and we try to meet that need through these comprehensive projects. We offer our students real-world projects that are dynamic in nature with different skill sets. We mentor them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they work together. They mentor each other as peers. They're learning on site problems that they don't even know how to solve yet. Problems we don't know how to solve yet. The freshman experience is unique because we try to get them into industries. Um, we do visits. We bring guest speakers in just to see if they're in the right major and in, heading in the right way. So if they see it in real life, they can build some excitement with it. So we try to connect them early, early in their college career. So, and then we wrap that back around. Well, we, we sprinkle it through the whole program, but in the senior year, they do more of that. I think our students come to Richmond Purdue Polytechnic because they are interested in the majors we offer. We have hands-on learning with the software. Um, they get to work in small groups, small classroom sizes. Um, they get practical, real-world experience, so they're ready for a job. They have a strong portfolio when they leave. I was either going to go to uh, IUPUI, was like my first choice originally, but then finding the different things here and knowing that the instruction series are ranked really high in the state for all colleges, uh, the degree programs they had, knowing that this Purdue degree is an actual Purdue degree from West Lafayette as well, and then just knowing the affordability that this is a lot cheaper than going to the main campus. 
and it's within driving distance. I don't have to pay for housing. I can just drive back and forth. It just it all fell into place that this was a really good fit for me. So I just uh, did all like my testing and came here, and I think it's one of my best choices I've ever made. I learned that it's the same like same recognition as the main campus degree, so I thought, why not go here? It's more affordable. I had actually had a friend who was coming here, and uh, I thought he was actually going to the big uh, main campus, Purdue. Um, so I'd asked him a few questions, like, hey, can you tell me anything about West Lafayette? And he had said, well, I can help out, but um, I don't go there. And he had told me that he actually comes here. And so I, I decided to look into it, figured out that this is definitely much more of a fit for me um, than a big campus. Um, came down here and have really been enjoying it ever since. So I guess word of mouth was how I discovered this. I want to thank everyone who participated in this week's In Focus program. We greatly appreciate you taking some time and giving it to us. Robin Hood and the Heroes of Sherwood Forest. That's going on this weekend at Richmond Civic Theater. It is a stage one performance. Go rct.org if you need more information on that. Easter egg hunt time is going on. There's a couple this weekend, Saturday, um, beginning at noon at the Jeffers Unit for the Boys and Girls Club. It's a community Easter egg hunt. And also the Greens Fork Community Center is having an Easter egg hunt from 1 to 2.30 in Greens Fork. The information is there on the screen. Getting close to the end of school, which means you're going to be looking for something for the kids to do. And here's an idea. Sign them up for summer classes at Hayes Arboretum. It's almost that time. Register in person or online. Check out what's going on this summer at Hayes Arboretum. It's April, which means Earth Day is coming up very, very quickly, and there is actually a t-shirt design contest going on for this year's Earth Day. You can get some information on that by checking out what's going on at COPE. And don't forget that Earth Day is coming up on the 27th. But this is a t-shirt design contest, and you have to have that submitted by April 25th. There's also a call for nominations for the 6th Annual Athena Leadership Award. Submission deadline is April 26th. Visit WayneCoAthena.com for more information. In-person absentee or early voting, if you want to call it that, has already started. Voter Registration Office, 301 East Main Street, Monday, 8.30 to 5, Tuesday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30, Saturday, April 27th and May 4th. It'll be taking place from 9 to 4. The last day is May 6th from 8.30 until 12. You can visit the clerk's website if you want more information. The reason you're getting registered and doing some voting right now is that there is a mayoral primary between two candidates, Dave Snow, Jack Cruz. That's the focus of next focus of next week's In Focus here on WGTV Channel 11. They'll spend 90 minutes with us. If you want to get questions to us ahead of time for these two candidates, send them to WCTV at IUE.edu. Please get them to us by 5 o'clock on Wednesday, and we'll be happy to get those in. Thank you very much for watching this week's In Focus. We appreciate all of the support that we've gotten on this show and need to give some some thanks to Brandon Gentry, who is a Purdue Polytechnic student who was one of the shooters on this show and also did the editing. So thank you very much to Brandon and Ryan for helping us out.